Turn with me in the book of the prophet Sephaniah. Chapter 2, I will begin reading in verse 4. Unfortunately, we don't have a projector right now. It's going to be hard for me to explain and let you see visually. But I hope next week we can buy the projector. It is badly needed. And I'm thankful that, you know, somebody donated a big month, amount of money for, for that uh, equipment. So let's read, brothers and sisters. I will do my best to explain it as simple as I know how. For Gaza shall be forsaken. Ashkelon, you're hearing these names now over the news. Desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday. And Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast. The nation of the Chiritites, the word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will destroy you. There shall be no inhabitant. The sea coast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah, not for the PLO. For the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. In the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will intervene for them. And return their captives. I have heard the reproach of Moab. And the insults of the people of Ammon. Which they have reproached my, which they have reproached my people. And made arrogant threats. Are you hearing it? Arrogant threats. Against their borders. And therefore as I live. Says the Lord of hosts. The God of Israel. Surely Moab. Shall be like Sodom. And the people of Ammon like Gomorrah. Overrun with weeds and salt pits. And a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them. And the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride. Because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them. For he will reduce to nothing. Reduce to nothing. All the gods of the earth. Meaning all false religion. And that unfortunately includes Islam. People shall worship him. Each one from his place. Indeed all the shores of the nations. You Ethiopians also. You shall slain by my sword. May our heavenly father bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, brothers and sisters. Of course, you are all aware, it's all over the news. A few nights ago, I received a call from Brother John from San Francisco. It was close to midnight. He was very excited. He was asking me about my opinions about what's going on. And we shared, I shared, so we talked for less than an hour. One thing we can learn from this surprise attack. Israel with a huge chunk of their national budget, like three billions for the intelligence of the Mossad. One of the most um, sophisticated, most advanced intelligence agency in the world. Last Saturday's attack caught them flat-footed. They were caught 
of guard. There had been reports coming from Egypt of the impending Hamas attack. But for some reason, the government of Israel ignored it. They had been training the Hamas how they will carry on this surprise attack. Never in the history of Israel had they been attacked by air, by land, and by sea. So Hamas is actually getting sophisticated, getting well-trained. And one thing we can learn, Israel had been overly confident because they have the military capability to suppress any attack. Church, that is one lesson you need to be careful of. Don't be overly confident with how much money you have, with your position, with everything that around you that you think can be your source of protection. Because if your confidence leans on the material, you will be attacked surprisingly by our spiritual enemy. You notice that it's getting difficult as we approach the end. It's going to be even more difficult. The Bible did not promise us a rosy future. Matthew 24 is clear. This is the beginning of sorrow. Amen? Amen? So stop living in your fantasy land. I would like to warn you, to caution you, don't take what's going on around us today lightly. God have already allowed the world to take a, a pause when COVID-19 hit the world. It was a pause. It was a warning from the Almighty God. And I remember during those days, everybody becomes and became so spiritual. Because of COVID-19. And now that everything apparently and seemingly going back to normal, even Christians have become slack again. And now we see these things around us today. The world is polarized between two camps. Not Palestinians, but those who believes that Israel has no right to exist. There have been rallies and demonstrations all over the world. You will see Palestinian supporters in Iraq in mass burning Israeli flag. In Australia, in the streets of New York, in Spain, in France. So the world is being shaken by what is going on to a very tiny land in Israel. So brothers and sisters, we've read about these territories, Gaza, Askelon, Asdod, Ekron. Actually, these are five cities that is part of the old Philistine territory. Captured in the times of Joshua. It was given to the nation of Israel. Why is this war, brothers and sisters in Israel right now, is happening and the world thinks that the two-state solution is the antidote. When I say two-state solution, that is to allow both the Palestinians and Israel live together 
and Jerusalem as a divided capital between two nations. That will never happen. Israel will never allow the city of Jerusalem be shared with the Palestinians because that's the eternal city of God. That's the capital of the nation of Israel established by King David more than 2,500 years ago. So what's the reason behind this? I'm not going to dwell on the political reason, the economic reason. That's beside the point. It's very, very complicated. I have been studying the whole week. So if I will start on the political side, brothers and sisters, I'm just going to confuse you, especially if you have... If you are really not aware. But I'm going to bring you back to the beginning. How it all started. Brothers and sisters. So I don't have a, uh, a projector. I will narrate the whole history. From Abraham's time to 1948. Amen? Amen. Alright. So, look at me as your granddad telling you a bedtime story. It all started with a single man who lives in the land of Ur. Genesis chapter 12. And he heard the voice of God saying, get out of thy country and thy kindred and go to a land that I will show you. That man's name is Abram, not Abraham. Married to Sarai. So they went out and God made a covenant with him saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you offspring whose numbers is like the stars of heaven and as the sons of the sea. He, being childless, was given that promise. And then they went, moved forward to Genesis 15. The Lord said, to your seed, I'm going to give this land. And the Lord gave the geographical location. So next Sunday, probably I could show you the map. It's big. It's thrice the size of the current size of Israel today. It reaches all the way to Syria, Lebanon, brothers and sisters, and part of Egypt, and all the way to some part in Iraq. It's a huge geographical territory. And Abraham said, Lord, you gave me this promise. I don't even have a child. What happened is, here comes the wife who cannot wait for the promise to be fulfilled and gave Abraham his bondmaid or handmaid, Hagar. And Abraham submitted, sired a child. And here comes Ishmael. And Genesis 17, move forward. Again, the Lord reaffirmed and reconfirmed the covenant. He said, Lord, I am now 100 years old. And Sarah is now past childbearing. How in the world is it going to come to pass? And the Lord said, I'll visit you again. And when I do, Sarah, your wife, is going to give you a son. What about Ishmael? The Lord said, I'm going to bless Ishmael. Twelve princes shall come forth out of him. I'll bless him. I'll make him wealthy. But the Lord said, my covenant will be with Isaac. So now you have two seeds. 
claiming to be the heir of the promise. Ishmael and Isaac. And then if you read, brothers and sisters, further on, Ishmael was bullying Isaac and Sarah saw it. And she was furious. She was angry and told Abraham, remove the band woman with her son. They will not be heir with my son. Of course, it hurt Abraham because that's his son. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. Hearken to the voice of thy wife. So Hagar and Ishmael was cast out. And then from Isaac came brothers and sisters, Jacob. Amen? Who's the other brother? Esau. So you notice that there is always a two line. Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob. And both of these other sons became enemies of the original legal heir. And from Jacob came the 12 sons, which eventually became the 12 tribes of Israel, of how the nation of Israel was formed. And you know what happened? Joseph was sold, and he stayed in Egypt, and eventually rose to prominence and became the second most powerful man in Egypt. He became the viceroy of Egypt. So when famine came, Jacob was forced to flee the land of promise and dwelt in Egypt because there is enough food in Egypt. And they stayed there until Joseph died. But Joseph made a prophecy. He said, the Lord is going to visit you again. And when he does... Carry my bones with you back to the land of my fathers and bury me there. When Joseph died, there arose a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. We're still in the book of Genesis. All right? And then 400 years have come and gone. 400 years. So this Pharaoh that did not know Joseph started enslaving and maltreating the nation of Israel. Now we are going to Exodus. Exodus means departure. That's the meaning of the word Exodus. And then God raised up a man by the name of Moses. After 400 years, they were delivered from the Egyptian bondage. And God made a covenant with the nation which is called the Sinaitic Covenant. Ten Commandments was given. The law was given. And now you have Exodus, Leviticus, brothers and sisters, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses, because of his disobedience, failed to enter the promised land. And Joshua took over. Brothers and sisters, he was the lieutenant of Moses. Are you following me? So it's, listen carefully, because this is like a bedtime story to you, like a Sunday school. So when Joshua took over, brothers and sisters, at the end of the book of Joshua, he divided the land, but there are still unconquered territories. Because after being away for 400 years, what to expect? Brothers and sisters in Canaan, of course, there's now another inhabitants who started possessing the land because the original owner was gone for 400 years. So when they came back, they have to take it territory by territory, piece by piece, Jericho and, and many others. But even at the end of Joshua's leadership, the entire promised land was not restored back to the Jews. 
And before Joshua passed away, he asked the people, are you going to serve God or not? And the whole nation of Israel said, we will serve the Lord. Remember now, it was done by Moses as well. And they said, we'll serve the Lord. And they did not. Joshua took over and said, at the end of his life, are you going to serve the Lord? They said, we serve the Lord. And Joshua put stones and he said, this stone serves as a memorial and as a witness that you have made a covenant now with God that you're not going to serve any more idols. Joshua died. Who took over? Now you're entering the book of Judges. If you read the book of Judges after Joshua died, it says there, another generation rose up that did not know the Lord. They don't have a kingdom yet. The judges were leaders. If you read the book of Judges, brothers and sisters, you see a vicious cycle of Israel disobeying the Lord, being reminded, disobeying the Lord, being reminded, disobeying the Lord. So it's, it's, it's a vicious cycle of disobedience and return. And that's the time the last of the judges was Samuel. So after the judges, the next book would be the first and second Samuel. Praise the Lord. All right. That's, this is the, the whole Bible now. So when Samuel came, the people were clamoring for a king. We want a king, they said. And Samuel said, you have a king. God is your king. No, 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 no. We would like a king pretty much like the Gentile nation. So they would like to copy the style of the Gentiles without realizing they have been a separated people. Samuel warned them, if you will have a king, he will take your sons and make them soldiers. You have to pay him. He will take your daughters to be his wives and concubines and all of the negative of having a king to rule over them. But they said, in spite of what Samuel or Samuel told them of the repercussion of having a king to rule over them, said, never mind, we still want a king. And the first king that God appointed was a Benjamite king. The Benjamite tribe is the least of all the tribe. Benamin, Benoni, Saul. Saul was a tall guy, like six foot something. That's why among the crowd, he stood, uh, you know, Above the rest. And the Lord said, that's the man. So when Saul was appointed king, that's the beginning of the kingdom of Israel. All right? How many years did Saul reign? 40 years. But a man is filled with jealousy. Why? Because he started disobeying the Lord. How did it start? Samuel told him, do not offer anything. Okay? And Samuel said, the Lord said, go out to that land, kill everything. Man, woman, children, everybody. And all the animals, kill them. Spare no one. And when Samuel came and asked Saul, did you obey the Lord? And Saul said, yes, I did. And Samuel said, then why do I hear the sound of these animals making noises? Well, you know, I would like to use them to offer unto the Lord. So, you know, we can use those things. And Samuel was furious. He said, to obey is better than sacrifice. He tore his garment and said, now your kingdom is taken away from you. It's going to be given to another. 
And that was the beginning of Saul's downward spiral. He went from bad to worse. And the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and started being tormented by a demon spirit. Are you following me? And the Lord told Samuel, go to the house of Jesse. Because in the house of Jesse, there is a man there that I'm going to appoint to replace this king. So he went to the house of Jesse. Who is Jesse? According to Jewish history, Jesse is a prominent man. Okay, he is well known. Everybody looks up to him. He, he, he holds a high position. So when Samuel came, the people, the people was afraid. Because when a prophet comes, only two things can happen. Blessing or curse. And he went to the house of Jesse, brothers and sisters, and said, the Lord told me to come to you and said, one of your sons is going to be appointed to replace King Saul. So he paraded all the sons except David. You know why? You know the story. Jesse was actually ashamed of David. Jesse doesn't like him. Samuel said, are these all your sons? Well, I still have one. He's out there in the field tending my flocks. Call him. Because when the first child came, Samuel said, this is the guy. Because his basis was Saul. Physically well built, tall guy, handsome, everything. So when he saw the first born child, he said, maybe this is the same guy. And the Lord rebuked Samuel. He said, don't look at the outward. For God looketh not on the outward, but on the inward. What a rebuke from the Lord. So here comes a raggedy young fellow who has no desire to be a king. He was just happy out there in the field worshiping the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David was a worshiper. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But he is not an ordinary worshiper. There is a warrior inside of him. Because here comes a bear, slew him. Here comes a lion, slew him. So when David came, an innocent young boy... And the Lord whispered unto the ears of Samuel and said, that's the guy. And David was anointed and the ram's horn was blown. You're going to replace the king. Oh, did David rush to Saul and said, go down, I'll take over? No. From the time he was anointed to his ascension to the throne, it took 15 years. So what's the story? After the anointment, here comes Goliath shaming Israel. And the king was so afraid. Everyone, from the king to the least of the soldiers, they were so afraid. Amen. It's a huge guy, brothers and sisters, saying things threatening the nation of Israel, and they were all sort of afraid. And David was told by his dad, your brothers are now camping in that part. Bring them food. Because they have enlisted into Saul's army. So when David went there, his brothers were, <laughs> you know, angry at him. Why are you here? You're supposed to be in the field. Tending our father's flock. You're here because you always want to be in the action. You know, they're all jealous of him for whatever reason. So no, 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 dad said, I'm, you know, I should bring you food. And then while there, David heard the rumors, the noise, you know, and heard this giant defaming and, 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 and saying things 
You know, that is not good to hear. And David said, why do you allow this uncircumcised to shame the armies of the living God? And he's the only one singing a different tune. Everyone is so afraid. And then he heard the rumor and said, you know, whoever kills that guy, the king will, will make him wealthy and the king's daughter will be given to him. Said, oh, David said, wow, opportunity. Praise the Lord. And then David said, I will fight. So the rest were cowards and the rest were afraid. This little guy, because he had an experience killing bear and lion and God was with him, said, I'm going to fight him. And what David said reached the ears of King Saul. So he was summoned. Actually, they met before because when Saul was being tormented by a demon spirit, David was summoned to play his harp before the king and the demon spirit flee. All right? So David went there and said, I heard that you want to fight the, the, the giant. David said, yeah. Would you like to try this armor? It was too big for him. said, my king, I'm never going to use an armor that I have not used before. It's too big for me. You can't use other man's testimony. You have to have your own. Amen? So don't use something that you have not yet tested. So he settled for his sling. All right? But, but when he appeared before King Saul, he said, you're just but a boy. No, 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 my king. I may be a boy. But while I was tending my dad's flock, here comes a lion, I killed him. Then here comes a bear after a few days, I killed him too. The God that was with me in killing those wild beasts will be with me and I'm going to kill that guy. Praise the Lord. While everybody chickened out, David was brave. Amen. If you are a true worshiper, you should be brave. Because the true worshipers are not cowards. Can I hear an amen? amen. To make the long story short, here comes David. And when Goliath saw him, <laughs> you're but a mosquito. And David said, well, you came here with sword and spear. I come to you in the name of the living God. And with one shot, hit Goliath's forehead, fell down, and died. And David took his sword, beheaded him. And David took his head. And he went back to the camp bringing the head of the giant. Can you imagine the faces of every Israeli soldier? They were all shocked. An unknown boy became the most popular guy in Israel. Hallelujah. Did that make Saul happy? For a little while. And then David became part of his army and then started killing thousands. Have you not read Zechariah chapter 12? The feeble in the end time, the most feeble, meaning the weakest among the Jews, will be like David. And the strongest among them will be like God. How are you going to defeat that kind of people? Amen? So when David became part of Saul's army, here comes the ladies singing this song. Ho, ho, ho. Saul killed hundreds, but David killed thousands. Ooh. And that fell on his ears and he became jealous. So while they were dining, the, 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 the countenance of Saul was just dark and he has a spear and he threw it at David for no apparent, well, the reason is jealousy. And David ran for his life. So to make the long story short, eventually Saul was killed and David replaced him. Now David is the next king of the United Kingdom of Israel. 
He ruled how many years? 40 years. All right? And you know the story of David. Brothers and sisters, he had sons, he had daughters. But when the Lord gave him rest against his enemies, he was in his sports trying to relax and saw a beautiful married woman. But Siba, of all the place that that woman could take a bath, why take a bath that somebody can see you if you have no intention of seducing him? Agree? So eventually David was seduced that night. They have a love affair. And then, but Siba got pregnant. And David wants to cover up his sin. And he called Uriah and did everything, persuaded him to lie down before his wife, but to no avail. So Uriah said, how can I lie down with my wife when all of my comrades were out there fighting in a battle? Because Uriah was a religious man. He was zealous. He loves the Lord. Because if Uriah will make love to his wife, then David can cover up his sin and say, I'm not the father of that child. But Uriah did not. So David has no choice. So he wrote one of his generals and said, you put that guy to the fiercest part of the battle. So David now is plotting a murder. So he did not only commit adultery, now he is plotting a murder. And eventually Uriah died. And David heard the news, oh, finally, I'm going to have this woman. So temporarily he had a good time. But here comes Nathan the prophet telling him, My king, I have a case that I would like to bring before you for your judgment. Okay, well, you know, there is this shepherd who has one sheep. He loves that sheep so much, sleep with it, feed it, cared for it. But here comes a wealthy guy who, who owns a lot of sheep. And when he had a shindig, a party, instead of taking from one of his sheep, he took that one's shepherd sheep and kill it and that's what he served for his guest. What do you think should be done to this wealthy guy? And David said, that guy should be killed. And Nathan said, you are that guy. My. Praise the Lord. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. So this, the child died. Amen? But did the Lord rebuke and dis uh, told David to discontinue his relationship with Bathsheba? No. It's already there. Now this is the paradoxes of God. You know who came after the child who died? Solomon. And eventually, Solomon becomes the heir. Wow. Coming from a woman who is not supposed to be David's wife. All right? And then David said, I'm going to build a temple. The Lord said, no, 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 you're not. You're a man that shed many blood. Your child after you will be the one. Okay? But David prepared everything, the money and everything. So when Solomon took over, for 40 years, there was no war. No war. There was war in times of Saul. There was war in time of David. No war in times of Solomon. You know why? Because Solomon is wise. He married all the daughters of his enemies. Of course, no war. That's why he has 1,100 wives and concubines. Amen? Praise the Lord. Karakalna. And then eventually Solomon built a temple. So the United Kingdom of Israel lasted for 100 
20 years. Amen? 40, Saul. 40, David. 40, Solomon. But the Lord told Solomon, after you die, the kingdom will be divided. Because Solomon's heart was turned to idols. He started worshiping idols as well because the wives that he married persuaded him to worship other gods, unfortunately. And the Lord said, I'm going to break your kingdom. So when he died, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two houses. The house of Judah, that is composed of Judah and Benjamin, and the house of Joseph, which is the ten northern tribes. So now you have these two brothers and sisters. So if you have these two houses now, these two kingdoms, that is where Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, Amos, some of them are prophesying in the, in the south, some are prophesying in the north. So these were the times of the pre-exilic Prophets, meaning prophets before exile. Are you with me? So the ten northern tribes lasted for 200 years. And here comes the Assyrians and took them away and destroyed them. That's why it was called the ten lost tribe. The two southern tribes lasted for 300 years. And then here comes Nebuchadnezzar. And took them away captive. Ezekiel saw it. Daniel was there. He was a young man. When they were all carried to Babylon. How long? Now the ten northern tribes were scattered. In the four winds of heaven. But the two southern tribes. Were handed over to different empires. They stayed in Babylon for 70 years. If you read Daniel chapter 9, Daniel said, he was an old man at that time in Daniel 9. He said, Lord, I read the prophecy of Jeremiah that the desolation of Israel will only last for 70 years. What's next? All right? What's next? Do you remember the handwriting on the wall? Many, many, many tekel uparsin. Amen? That's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? That the kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians. So that night, the armies of Emperor Cyrus was already digging a tunnel. And that night, Belshazzar was murdered. And then here comes the Medo Persian. Daniel the prophet served two emperors. Brothers and sisters, the Emperor Nebuchadnezzar and Emperor Darius. Or Darius. So when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, that's not the Babylonians, that's the Medo Persians. Are you listening? Okay. In the Medo Persian Empire, there is Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Esther. Esther was married to a Persian king. Her name in Hebrew is Hadazah. Chains to Esther. Amen? Do you know the story of Esther? Brothers and sisters, another jealous guy by the name of Haman he was able to persuade the king to issue an edict. Let every Jew, let everyone, let everyone that is in thy colony worship no other god but your god. But the Jews keep worshiping their God. So there is an impending annihilation for the Jews because the king already ordered it. But Esther heard it. And then her uncle Mordecai approached her and said, Esther, you are now the wife of the king. Maybe the Lord allowed you to be married to her, that in such a time as this, God will use you. Now remember now, 
Even if you are a wife of the king, if the king did not summon you to come to him, you're not supposed to come to him. Because you might be killed or you will be punished and be killed. Unless the king will reach out his scepter to you, a gesture that you can approach him. So Esther said, okay, I will go to the king. And he said to his aides, her aides, I'm going to go to the king. I have to plead for my people. You cannot because the king did not summon you. I'm going to go there. Whatever would be the repercussion of this, I'm going to go there. She dressed herself so beautifully. Perfuming herself. You know. So when she entered the king's court, the king saw her. Wow. Taken by her beauty. And the king reached out the scepter and said, What can I do to you, my queen? And she told the whole story. Amen? And eventually to find out that it was Haman that plotted it. So the Jews were spared because of Esther. And Haman was hanged. And Mordecai the uncle replaced Haman. So even in the time that Israel was under foreign powers, brothers and sisters, in the time of the Babylonians in the Middle Persian, they were allowed to be in a high position. Because even Nehemiah was a cup bearer to King Artaxerxes. You read that. Amen? And there was a Persian emperor by the name of Cyrus, 150 years before he was born, Isaiah already prophesied that Cyrus, a Persian emperor, will build God a house. That's why when the Persian empire took over, defeating the Babylonians, they allowed the Jews to go home. Here comes Zerubbabel going home, building the temple. That's the time of Haggai and Zechariah. They were prophesying as Zerubbabel was building the temple. After the temple was built, here comes Ezra. So eventually, there were three periods of return. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. When Nehemiah came, they started building the walls. Fulfilling the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. And after the Middle Persian, who came next? Alexander the Great. Was Alexander the Great in the Bible? Yeah. Daniel chapter 8. The he-goat. Do you know your Bible? Alexander the Great is in the Bible. He died at the young age of 32 years old. But after reaching that age, he conquered the known world. Are you with me? When he died, his empire was divided to his four generals. Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and one other guy. All right? The Ptolemies, brothers and sisters, ruled Egypt. That's the time of Cleopatra. Amen? Praise the Lord. So here comes the Grecian. What did the Grecian do? They allowed the Jews to remarry. Alexander the Great built a library, brothers and sisters, in Istanbul, which is now Istanbul in Turkey. It's called Alexandria before. All right? So the, the Grecians trying to Hellenize the world, philosophy, everything. And the Bible was translated in Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Why was it called Septuagint? Meaning 70. Because there were 70 elders who translated the Bible from Hebrew to the Greek. Praise the Lord. Amen? All right. And then, brothers and sisters, we are approaching the time of Malachi. The last guy in the Old Testament. What happened to the second temple built by Zerubbabel? Another king. 
Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes. Now we are in the in between periods. Okay? After Malachi, here comes the 400 years. If you read, if you have a Catholic Bible, the Duai Bible, you have Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2. That tells the story behind. So what did they do? The Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, he offered pig in the altar, desecrated it. You can read Daniel chapter 8. There was a conversation between Daniel and the angel. He said, how long will it take until the abomination of desolation be taken away and the sacrifices be restored? And the angel said, unto 2,360 days, the temple shall be cleansed again. Who cleansed the temple? In the time of Esther, there was a feast. If I'm not mistaken, the Jews, in commemoration of the deliverance of the Jews in the hands of Haman, celebrated the feast which is called the Feast of Purim. Amen? Praise the Lord. And then, when the Maccabees came, Judah Maccabees and the brothers, and they killed Antiochus Epiphanes, and they cleansed the temple, rededicated it. Brothers and sisters, there is a, a history that says the menorah should not last that long. But for some reason, there is a miracle of the Hanukkah. Okay, the feast of the Hanukkah. Okay, they are not supposed to last that long because there's no more oil. But for some reason, the lights keep burning. Okay? And then here comes, eventually, brothers and sisters, what you called, well, if you don't know it, the Hasmonean dynasty. Came from the Maccabees. Okay? So, during this time, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then the Essenes, the scribe, and all of these, the Herodians, came into the picture. If you notice, you have two Middle Eastern powers, Babylon and Medo-Persia. And then you have an Eastern European power came on the picture, the Grecian Empire. But from the West, of Europe, another power is rising. Who? The Empire of Rome. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Empire of Rome. Hallelujah. And then Pompey, the general, was able to conquer it. Hallelujah. And then, brothers and sisters, in the time that Jesus was born, it was the time of Augustus Caesar. And he made an edict that all should go back to their land of birth, to their uh, country of birth. Amen? So Joseph and Mary have to travel, brothers and sisters, because they were from the tribe of? From where? Judah. But where is the prophecy concerning the birth of the Messiah? In Bethlehem. Of Iprata. Brothers and sisters. Does Augusto Caesar know about it? He doesn't know anything about it. All he wants is, let's number all the inhabitants and let them be listed. So there was a census. Without him knowing it, he's fulfilling prophecy. Hey, do you think what's going on now with these political people, with this Hamas, with the PLO, with the United Nations, the war in Iraq, the war in, in Ukraine, all of this war is not part of the prophetic picture. They don't know it. But they are actually doing and fulfilling what is already written in the Bible. Praise the Lord, everybody. All right? Hallelujah. Okay. So Joseph and Mary went, and that is where Jesus was born. Fulfilling Micah chapter 5, verse 2. 
And then here comes two years after. Here comes the Magi's from the East. The wise men, not three kings, wise men. Three years, I mean two years after Jesus was born, he said, enter Jerusalem. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Herod heard it. He said, king of the Jews, is there any other king here other than me? And he was angry. Amen? He said to the wise men, where did you see it? Well, we saw the star two years ago. And we have come. You know, and, and, and Herod said, if you found a child... Can you come back and let me know so I can worship him too? But he has a dark motive. He doesn't want to worship the king. He wants to kill him. But when the wise men, after seeing the infant Jesus, brothers and sisters, did not go back to inform Herod, he was angry. And the only way he could get rid of the child is the information he got from the wise men that the child was about two years old. So every two years old child down was slaughtered. And now everybody's saying, Oh, what about the children being killed in this war? Do I rejoice? No, of course, no. Amen? Nobody rejoices over the death of infants. But there had been infants killed since time immemorial. The time of Moses. The time of Jesus. How many babies were killed? Even if we don't like it, there there are evil people, brothers and sisters. Amen? You can't shake hands with someone who is out to kill you. You can't negotiate with that guy. Amen? Praise the Lord, everybody. So Jesus grew, preached in Israel, rejected by his own people, eventually was crucified. But he made the warning. In Matthew 24, the disciples showed him the temple, thinking that Jesus would say, wow, what a beautiful temple it was. Oh, it is. Because Herod renovated the temple that Zerubbabel built to gain the favor of the Jews. He beautified it. And still, if you go to Jerusalem, the wailing wall still stands. That's part of the old temple. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. So we're not talking about an old book here that has no significance. It's happening already. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And Jesus warned in Matthew 24, The disciples thought that Jesus will say something good. He said, watch, not one stone upon another in this temple that shall not be thrown down. Amen? He died 33 AD. 36 years after that, here comes the Romans. Burn Jerusalem and destroy the temple. And then the two southern tribes that was shifted from one empire, from the Babylonians to the Middle Persian to the Grecian to the Romans, were also scattered. So in 70 AD, you have the 12 tribes scattered from all corners of the earth. They have become wanderers. Some went to China. Some went to as far as Afghanistan. They were all scattered. Brothers and sisters. And Jerusalem <laughs> was conquered by Islam somewhere around 638 AD. Remember now. The religion of Islam is much younger compared to the religion of the Jews. Amen. Mohammedanism only was born around 680. Christianity is older than Islam. Are you with me? So when Caliph Omar went, brothers and sisters, conquered Jerusalem, 
in memoriam of his conquest, he built the al aqsa Mosque, which now you see stand on the very same spot where the Solomon Temple once stood. Because the Jews, can they do anything now? They are out of the land. Scattered again. Powerless. And then for hundreds of years, the Muslims were reigning over Jerusalem until the Pope of Rome pleaded with the kings of Europe to retake Jerusalem. Here comes the crusade. Amen? Have you seen the movie Kingdom of Heaven? That's it. So eventually, here come so many wars. And I think it reaches up to 11 or 12 crusades. So the knights from Norway, from Ireland, from England, from France, all over Europe, they traveled to the Holy Land. And there was fighting, amen, between the Muslims and, 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 and the Jews. So eventually, there was a a peace agreement. Some parts of Jerusalem were given to the Christians. Some parts were given to the Muslims. But not to the Jews. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then, in history, the Jews were treated as antichrist. Why? Why? Because in Christianity, we blame the Jews for killing Jesus, isn't it? So everywhere they go, everybody hates them. I remember when I was a boy, if somebody hates you, they say, hoochoo, 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 hoochoo. Meaning you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Amen? But hey, it was God who blinded their eyes. Read Romans 11, the whole chapter 11 when you go home. Blindness and part happened to the Jews. But Paul said, did the Lord cast out totally his people? No, he said, no, 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 no. He blinded them so that you and I, Gentiles, can be grafted in. So when the Lord was rejected by the Jews, the gospel went to the Gentiles. So God, for a short time, turned his back to the Jews. You don't want my offer? Up you go. So he dispersed them from the four winds of heaven. And the Gentiles for 2,000 years had been enjoying the word of God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. But as Paul said, did God totally abandon his people? No, 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 no. Blindness in part happened to Israel until when? The fullness of the Gentiles. And we are approaching the fullness. Just a short time, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. And now all over Europe, the Jews were being, you know, in, in, in Muslim countries, the Jews cannot walk side by side in the same footing as a, as, a, as a Muslim. The Jews will walk in a lower ground and the Muslim will walk in the upper ground. Some were forced to convert to Islam. Some were even forced to convert to Catholicism. Because all of the known plagues, like the bubonic plague, the black plague that killed 500, 500 million people in Europe was blamed to the Jews. If the number is exaggerated, well, you can always go back to Google. So they were blamed. But for some reason, they started becoming wealthy. <laughs> because God cannot abandon his people. Hallelujah. Wherever they go, they flourish. Hallelujah. There's so many learned Jews. Brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. I can name them to you next Sunday. So many learned brothers and sisters. Very good. Karl Marx is a Jew. The one who invented communism. Amen? And now here comes 
somewhere in the 1800s. A man by the name of Theodore Herschel started forming an organization called the Zionist Movement. Composed of business people, intellectuals, everyone. Brothers and sisters. And because they have so much money, they want to buy the land. How much is that? <laughs> they just want to buy it. Okay? Because they want to go home. The longing of every Jew is next year, Passover will be celebrated in, in Israel. And it's also because there are pogroms. Pogroms is persecution of the Jews in Europe. Russian pogroms, the, the German pogroms. Hallelujah. So from, from Herschel in the 1800s, brothers and sisters, there was no chance for the Jews to go home until the First World War. Now, one of the reasons there is conflict between the Palestinians and Israel today, Great Britain has a big role in this because they made a double dealing with the Palestinians and with the Jews. Because remember, America in the First World War was not yet a superpower. It was Great Britain. America became a superpower after the Second World War. It was Great Britain. The last Muslim power that was in charge of Jerusalem and Israel was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire lasted for some 500 to 600 years. The Ottoman Turks, the Turkish. The longest empire. It was defeated by the British. Amen. 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 And the Jews in Britain were lobbying in the parliament. Can you now give a piece of land for the Jews? And then eventually, they succumbed to the pressure. Brothers and sisters, so when General Allenby went to Jerusalem... He supported brothers and sisters that the Jews will be given a small partition of land. So after the 1914 Balfour Declaration of Independence, the Jews started coming home. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Jews started coming home. And that sparked the conflict. Why? Because now the Muslim says, the Jews are coming home. The Jews are coming home. Whoa. Amen. So when they went back, brothers and sisters, lots of the land of Israel were just marshes, untilled, everything. Many of their first leaders were part of the first pioneers. Moshe Dayan, Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, all of these guys went back. Some of them even fought the Nazis during the Second World War. But what really was a game changer was the Second World War. When Hitler killed six million Jews. Look at the footages. They went to the concentration. We went there to Auschwitz in Poland. We made a trip there many years ago. So we saw it. And then when we were in the States, we went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Appalling sight. It will turn your stomach upside down. How the Jews were treated. Like animals. When the, when the Allied forces liberated much of Europe, they were surprised. When they entered a place, a camp, 
they were zombies like people. They were bones and skin. And when the Americans entered the, the camp, the smell of the dead, the stench, oh, unbearable. So they called General Patton, Dwight Eisenhower to see. And they were surprised. And of course, a lot of people died. Gypsies, Polish, you know. But six million Jews were slaughtered systematically. The Nazis called it the last solution. You know the story, brothers and sisters. That prompted the Jews feeling unsafe in Europe to go home. And then in May 14, 1948, Ben Gurion assembled the Knesset and said, we need to declare our independence. May 14, 1948. That was the beginning. We started in Genesis. We are now in 1948. Next Sunday, we'll continue this. Bye-bye. Heavenly Father, Lord, you have given us information, understanding of thy word. Is it to make our head big? No. But to equip us, Lord, to make us aware that all of these things that's happening around us today is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. I just hope and pray, Lord, that your people will become aware of what's going on and will really take heed and pay attention to the voice of thy spirit. Because, Lord, we are slowly approaching the end. I thank you, Lord, for the understanding. Thank you, Lord, for sending a prophet messenger, an apostle to, to the end time that allowed us, Lord, to have all this understanding, Lord. Father, all the glory and the honor belongs to you alone in the mighty and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Church, mapalad tayo. We are not groping in the dark. A lot of churches, they don't know this. Kaya nag-o-offer ako ng prophetic seminar for free. At meron nag- Invite sa Olonga po. Pastor. Sabi niya, we want to know, we want to learn, we want to learn. Can you come? Yeah, of course. But one day is not, it's never going to be enough. Three days, sabi ko, Pastor. Sabi niya, o oh, sige po, sige po, kami bahala sa hotel mo, no? I can pay my hotel. Just provide the food. Alam niyo, sa ibang denomination, may bayad. May registration pa yan. Libo. Libo ang bayad. And then what will you hear? Nothing. Si mga nag G12, may bayad yun. 3-5. Bawat attendees. Sipin mo yan, mga kapatid. Mapalad tayo lahat. Nalulungkot lang ako sa ilang mga kapatid natin parang walang sense of urgency. Dalangin ko po, wag tayo matulad sa Israel that were caught off guard. Because it will come like a thief in the night. Amen. I hope na lahat ng mga members ng TJC ay bukas ang mata ang tenga while doing your business, whatever, 
pakitaas po ng kaunti ang inyong spiritual consciousness. Alam nyo, in, 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 while ako po, the, almost the whole week, sabi ko, wala talagang kwenta yung whatever you have right now. Totoo talaga yung sinabi ni Paul, godliness with contentment is great gain. Pag nakontento ka sa buhay mo, wala kayong kaingit-ingit sa kanino man dyan sa labas. Bakit? Kasi masaya ka. Naiintindihan mo ang buhay mo. Mga kapatid. So, church, pakiusap po sa lahat. Huwag kayong malungkot kung may mga financial problem kayo. Wag po. Huwag kayong malungkot kung may mga issues tayo ngayong hinaharap sa buhay natin. Wag po kayong malungkot. Alam niyo kung bakit? Minsan paraan ng Diyos yun para kausapin tayong lahat. Kung ang lahat ay ayos, nagiging kampante tayo. Nasa lazy boy, kuya kuya koy. Tinan nyo ang Israel. May musad na yan. Three billion dollars ang budget ng intelligence nila. <laughs> ano nangyari sa kanila? Flat-footed. 1,300 Jews were massacred. Imagine that. Kaya si Netanyahu ngayon talagang yung kanyang political life is already at stake because under his watch nangyari yan. Buti na lang, itong gerang ito united the nation of Israel. Opposition party, lahat ngayon, they are one. Para kung nakikita yung Zechariah 12, and the leaders of Judah shall be like a flame of fire. I have never seen the nation of Israel so united as they are right now. Pag ito yung nag-spill over, because we don't know what's gonna happen. Isang kinagalit ng Hamas, yung Abraham Accord. Ano yung Abraham Accord? Ginamit pa si Abraham. Tama? Abraham Accord ay paraan ng Israel para mawin ang Arab world. So yung Qatar, Saudi Arabia, nagpirma sa Abraham Accord. Ayaw yun ng Hamas dahil mawawala sila sa picture. The moment ang Israel makuha ang puso ng mga Arab, wala ng support. Amen? So merong puppet master behind this. Walang iba kung hindi ang Iran. Ang Iran ang nag... Hindi ko maintindihan si George Bush eh. O si, si Biden. Just recently, binigyan ng ilang bilyong dolyar ang Iran. Hmm? Mga kapatid, kahit si Netanyahu, there was a time na kumiling sa mga Hamas. Dahil pacifist eh. Pragmatist. Ayaw niya ng gulo. Eh, ito ngayon no? Pag nag-spill over yan, kasi nagbobombahan na sa Lebanon. Di ba? Yung Lebanon, bakit ma- kailangan ng Lebanon? Diyan manggagaling yung timber na gagamitin sa Third Temple. Pubukas yan. Ha? So yung Lebanon, sino na sa Lebanon? Hezbollah. Syria. Andito yung Jordan. So ito yung Israel, andyan yung Lebanon, andyan yung Syria, andito ang Jordan, andito ang Egypt. Ang gasa nandoon malapit sa dagat. Eh, mga kapatid. Amen? So ano ang magiging reaction ng mga Arab the moment na maglan assault ang Israel? Wala silang choice to, but to do this. Kaya ang mga Americans ngayon pinapauwi na. Pati yung mga tao nila sa Jerusalem, they're now being called back home. Because this war could spill over into a bigger war. 
Church, anong hinihintay natin? Pag nakuha yung alag sa mosque, that's it. Goodbye. Sorry. So, very, very, you know, uh, volatile ang situation. Very volatile. Things could change in a snap of a finger. Amen? Di mo alam how people will react. Kasi ngayon, it, la, ang lahat ng Arabo galit, galit sa Israel. Because of the children also being killed sa part ng mga Palestinians. We don't like that. Pag nakikita ko yung mga bata, just ko, madudurog ang puso mo, but what can you do? Ang mga Hamas, they're using it as human shield. They capitalize on it. Kaya nga nung pinag-usapan, eh bakit kayo? Pinagtatanggol niyo yung mga Hudyo. Remember now, hindi tinarget ng Hamas ang military installation ng Israel. Mga civilian. Ang Israel pag umatake, they don't attack civilian, they attack the military installation. Kaya lang may collateral damage. That's war. But do we rejoice in the death? Of course not. But unfortunately, is this the last? Hindi po. Even if Israel will win, mag- fast forward na ako ha, fast forward na to. Even if Israel win this and they will start building the temple, there is another bloody coming. And they will be removed again out of the land. When? When the Antichrist will come. Many Jews will be killed but a portion will be spared. That's the woman Israel will go to America to be spared because they will enter the millennium alive and they will repopulate the earth. Dahil sa kanila magahari ang 12 apostles. So is this the end? <laughs> Brace yourself. Things is gonna get worse. Rocky. So kung paanong may gera sa Israel, ang bride is type of Israel. Kung spiritual Israel ka at wala kang gera sa buhay mo, mag-isip-isip ka na. Baka ka-holding hands mo si Satanas. Amen. Salamat sa pagsubok. Because I know na ako'y lumalakad sa daan ng Panginoon. Amen po? Of course, hindi lahat pagsubok. Season. Ang ibig ko lang sabihin, kailangan may gera sa buhay natin. Kasi sa Israel, hindi nawawala ng gera. Lagi may gera. But the good thing is, fast forward again, read Daniel chapter 12. Ano sabi doon? Michael the angel will defend your people. Na habang binabasa ko yung kagabi, kinikilabutan ako kasi ang nakikita natin is a physical battle. What about what's going on in the spirit world? What about the battle? And there is an army of God defending the nation of Israel. Even when the Antichrist comes, Michael will still defend. Kahit may mga mga matay sa kanila. Di ba yun ang cry ng souls under the altar? How long, O oh Lord? The fifth seal. Will you not avenge our blood to them that dwell on the earth? Ang sabi ng Panginoon, wait for a little season until your fellow brethren and servants will be killed the same as you. So this is not the end. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. Sana ng ating escape, rapture. Make sure, children, lahat kayo na nakakarinig ng boses ko, make sure you have the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're baptized in Jesus' name and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Make sure. Dahil kung yan ay nangyari sa inyo, confirm ang ticket ninyo. Pagka lumipad tayo, kasama kayo lahat, kasama tayo lahat. Can we say Amen. Salamat sa Diyos. Kaya anuman ang dinadaanan ninyo sa mensahe na ito, hey, 
Press on. Huwag kayong hihinto. Amen po? Huwag kayong hihinto. Hindi tayo pababayaan ng Diyos, mga kapatid. God will be with us and He will carry us through. God bless you all and have a good day. Amen. <laughs>